Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Film Fan Club Show. I'm Sam Carrico, and we've got a big show for you guys today. Later on, we're going to have a preview of the Tonkawa Film Festival. Before that, we're going to talk to filmmakers John Swab and Jeremy Rosen about their new movie, One Day as a Lion. But first, trailers, man. This week had more trailers than my hometown, and I'm from Oklahoma. It started with the new Marvel Disney Plus series, Secret Invasion. It's about Nick Fury, who finds out that people in the MCU are being replaced with imposters. Huh, maybe the people working behind the scenes are imposters. That would explain Phase 4. But DC is still releasing movies too, apparently. Last week, they dropped the first trailer for Blue Beetle, which is about a teenager who learns to be a hero. Wow, what a concept. What could go wrong there? Okay, it's not exactly like Shazam. This movie also has George Lopez. Wait, really? Between this and Quantumania, what is it with the Shark Boy and Lava Girl references? Let's move on to something more original, like Joker 2. The sequel has officially wrapped production, and director Todd Phillips gave us our first official look at Lady Gaga as Harley Quinn, in addition to some leaked set images. My big takeaway is how they keep updating Harley Quinn to reflect modern times. In 2016, Margot Robbie portrayed her as an e-girl, and here, Lady Gaga is clearly going for more of the fentanyl addict look. Regardless, though, both versions make me have the same reaction. I can fix her. I saw the new Super Mario Brothers movie over the weekend. Like Shazam, I went in fully expecting to hate it, and it was actually pretty good, guys. You could tell the filmmakers had a lot of care for the original video games. This movie had more Easter eggs in it than any basket I saw over the weekend. Essentially, this is a movie about a guy who learns to enjoy mushrooms, like me in high school. I kid, but I'm impressed by how they were able to simplify the game mythos into a movie that's pretty straightforward. But as much as I applaud the crew, the cast never quite got there for me. Chris Pratt as Mario and, I hate to say it, Charlie Day as Luigi are two of the biggest miscasts in recent memory. There are some bright spots, though. I like Anya Taylor-Joy as Peach and Jack Black as Bowser as a standout, but that's where we're at, where I'm saying, at least they got Jack Black. Luckily, the narrative, the animation, and the set pieces are able to elevate this movie above its lackluster cast. It's like a case of uh, the right message, but with the wrong messenger. Like when Donald Trump says defund the FBI, or Ezra Miller says trans rights. Okay, we've got a great show for you lined up. I hope you'll stick around for our preview of the Tonkawa Film Festival, but let's get right to my interview with One Day as a Lion filmmakers, director John Swab and producer Jeremy Rosen. John, Jeremy, welcome to the show. I just want to start off by, I usually start off by saying congratulations on the film, but I feel like I should say congratulations on the films. So I'll put it to either of you guys, whoever want to take it first. Uh, you've had three films, Candyland, Little Dixie, and then now One Day as a Lion come out before even May. So what? it's been a roller coaster of a year, it seems like. How has it felt for you? You know, great, great question, Sam. It's um, It certainly wasn't intended to be a one, two, three punch in 2023. Uh, we actually shot Candyland back in 2021 um, and spent a lot of time letting it breathe by way of international film festivals. Um, so we thought that would come out in 22. Uh, it turned out to be top of the year in January, uh, followed by, of course, our beloved Little Dixie that Paramount released in February. And now uh, One Day's Align. It's been, um, we're punching way above our weight class. It seems more, far more prolific than is actually the case, but thank you. John, how has this felt for you from coming from the, you know, the filmmaking side? A lot of people, a lot of filmmakers, you're lucky to get a movie once every two years, but uh, you, how has it felt for you? You got three that people can see that just this year. It's It's been, I guess, surreal in hindsight. Um, you know, Jeremy and I, uh, we stay active, so there's not a lot of... Uh, time for reflection in the moment. Um, so, you know, when people bring it up to us, like you just did, it's kind of uh, gives me pause and thinks about it. I'm like, wow, you know, it really is, you know, amazing. Um, however, you know, I don't really impress myself in any way. Um, it's, it's more about just trying to get better and to keep growing what we're doing and, uh, and do it at a bigger scale and, and to continue to execute at a higher level. So, um, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunities. Uh, it's not without hard work, you know? Um, so it's nobody's, you know, uh, this hasn't been made easy for us. We, we fought for every opportunity and uh, we're proud of every outcome, so. And then jumping off of that, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, I wanna say you're a really good uh, crime thriller director, but I saw Candyland uh, earlier this year and it had a little bit more horror uh vibes so you kind of seem to be wanting to to grow with each project can you kind of 
talk about that a little bit and, and what made you, what's the kind of creative process whenever you are making these movies? Are you looking to challenge yourself? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Looking to challenge uh, myself and ourselves every time, um, you know, in Candyland was very much a, uh, you know, Jeremy and I, uh, the through line for us is is resentment, you know, and uh, things being born out of resentment. And, uh, you know, Candyland was very much a response to what we saw the current indie marketplace asking for and and, and, and glorifying, which was mostly uh, whitewashed, uh, very easy uh, softball type movies. And so we wanted to ram something down their throat that was... Uh, you know, hard hitting and unapologetic and, uh, you know, unabashedly us and, uh, and Candyland is that. And, um, I never made a horror movie. Um, it's, it's a really fun and liberating genre. Um, it's a forgiving genre and it lends itself to, uh, to, to a very indie budget. So, you know, that movie was conceived by design, um, to be what it was. And we're super proud with how it's gotten out there and, uh, and the way it's been received. So, Yes, and then you know, moving into One Day as a Lion, it had a lot more comedic elements to it than than any of our films had had in the past. So, you know, trying to evolve and and tackle different genres is something uh, I and and Jeremy and I are both interested in doing. So, Jeremy, how did this uh, how did this collaboration get started? You know, uh, it's it's yet another lesson in uh, in in happenstance and on how small uh, the world really is. Um, so, I'm currently here in. Los Angeles, my, my other home. Um, and uh, I was one day seated back in 2016 for reference. I was seated outside of my uh, my daily coffee shop, um, very uh, routine oriented. Um, so I sit outside with an espresso and my little dog reading my email. And um, unbeknownst to me, uh, two tables away sat John Swab. Um, and if it, if, it if it were not for his who I learned to be his father, uh, asking my dog's name, um, the rest would not be history. Um, John was in town, in LA that is, um, looking to sell what was his debut feature film, one, uh, Let Me Make You a Martyr, the one film he did prior to our partnership. Uh, I had just put out a film called Dog Eat Dog, directed by the legendary Paul Schrader, starring Nicolas Cage and Willem Dafoe. And, um, we got to talking, uh, became fast buddies. Uh, he and his then fiance were living in upstate New York um, before he returned to Tulsa. Um, and uh, I have a place in Vermont where I'm from. So uh, when I was back on the East Coast, we got together. I had read what was an early draft of our first film together, Run With The Hunted, and watched a screener of the aforementioned uh, Let Me Make You a Martyr. I was floored by both. And... Uh, tends to be my personality all or nothing, uh, which can be a gift and a curse. Uh, I said, I'm in, I'm going to produce everything you do and I'm going to manage you. And uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're on our, I think, eighth film together. John, do you want to describe your process of getting this collaboration going and how it's, uh, how it's evolved? Uh, I mean, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> there's the, the, the dog right there. Rocky. Yes. <laughs> uh, hey, Rocky. I love that. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, Jeremy laid it out perfectly. I mean, that's kind of how it happened. And, you know, the beauty of this whole thing is that, uh, you know, I was at a time in my life and at a place in my life when I met Jeremy that, uh, I had, I didn't have a lot of friends. Uh, you know, I, I was dating my then wife at the time and, you know, I got to know Jeremy, you know, in the context of potentially working together on the, on the film side. And, you know, the irony of it all is, is, uh, you know, we started out as, I guess, business partners and, and now have ended up, you know, best friends, you know, and, and that's happened through, you know, just the, uh, the grind and torture that is independent filmmaking. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a testament to he and I both and, and the kind of guys and character we have that, uh, you know, as hard as some of these movies have been to make, we, we've never turned on each other because we identify that, you know, we're two sides of the same coin in this thing. And, uh, and you know, without each other, none of this, you know, uh, would exist. You know, we, we, we you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty beautiful thing, you know, and uh, 
And I'm, I'm super grateful and fortunate to, to have found that in life. Cause I know how rare it is, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's been a really wild ride. He and I have had, uh, and, uh, we, we continue to grow and I think push each other to, to get better and to refine this thing. And, and, you know, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, here we are. So. And then I wanted to touch on, of course, I wore my Oki shirt today for a reason. Uh, a lot of your films, not all of them, but I believe uh, One Day as a Lion is shot in Oklahoma, like a lot of your films. Am I correct? Yeah, all except for Candyland, actually. So what what has kind of kept, kept bringing you back to Oklahoma? I love that being from northeastern Oklahoma, but what makes this a good place to shoot? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm from Tulsa. I was born and raised here. Um, you know, the irony is I thought, you know, my whole childhood, I grew up wanting to leave here to go out and pursue a, a career in making movies. Um, the irony is, is that, as I mentioned, I've made all but one here now. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, it's not, I'm not just saying it when I, when I, when I say that, uh, without Tulsa and without Oklahoma, I don't know if I would have ever made one film. Um, you know, the people here and the resources and relationships I have here because I'm from here, um, have made, you know, some, if not all these movies possible on some level, you know, um, and, uh, you know, Jeremy and I take a lot of pride in, uh, the work we do here and the jobs we've created, the, the, uh, economic impact these films have had and the relationships we have now. So, um, you know, we love being ambassadors for the state and, and I love, uh, you know, showcasing the state in these movies. Um, and I'll let Jeremy color in the rest. Yeah. Jeremy, oh. I always hear about how cool it is to, to see from Tolson's to, to see the Tulsa skyline or, or whatever it is, Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma landmarks on the big screen. You know, how, how do you feel, you know, being able to, to kind of bring that to people? Well, um, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and, um, as the uh, as one of the founders of of our beloved Circle Cinema uh, told me when I was uh, watching a movie there about a week or two ago um, that uh, that I'm an adopted Tulsa now uh, and I've and honestly Sam I I could have never imagined I mean if you would have told me ten years ago that I would know anything about Oklahoma let alone uh, uh, considering it to be another home um, I would have looked at you uh, in a very strange manner, but uh, but now it really does feel like another home to me. It's been so hospitable and film friendly um, and trustworthy, and John and I sure are grateful for it. Um, and it's become very personal to me as well, as though I am from there like John, um, because we do feel, to echo his sentiment, uh, to be ambassadors um, and to have helped pioneer the, uh, the state film program and, and even more so in Tulsa. Um, and uh, and have grown together uh, through all sorts of growing pains and and uh, ups and downs. But uh, but it, it it's a really a source of pride for us when we involve the local community um, as cast members, as crew members, the locations very much being to your point, the skyline, et cetera, and some of the rural towns uh, as depicted here in in One Day's Lion from uh, Bristow and and Venita and Barnsdall and um, and, and Stigler, uh, it's it's uh, Sand Springs, and of course Tulsa. Um, it's amazing. There's there's no um, better feeling. I mean, John and I have traveled the world uh, with these films from Oklahoma to the world to Switzerland and Italy and Netherlands and and these audiences around the world who have never set foot in Oklahoma are getting to see it through our films, and that's uh, it's very special for us. That's so exciting for me too. Just that 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 last sentiment right there too. The idea that uh, Tulsa and Oklahoma, the larger Oklahoma area, is being brought all over all over the world and showcased in a way that's not um, your typical you know your your typical Oklahoma stereotypes all the time. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about more about One Day as a Lion. I really hate to bury the lead here, but I want to hear John. How would you describe this film? Yeah, I mean it's a for me. And what interested me when I read it was that it's a kind of a throwback 90s independent style movie, um, you know, it, it, much in vain, uh, in the vein of like a, a Buffalo 66 or like an Elmore Leonard novel where all these characters are very colorful, three dimensional. And, uh, you know, and they're the, the characters are the focus of the movie rather than the story. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's an action comedy with, uh, a lot of heart. So Jeremy, I want to hear it in your own words. One day's a lion. Yeah, it is. Um, it was such a unique experience, uh, for, for John and I both, uh, most notably because it's the sole film John and I have done together that John did not write. Um, so that, uh, took on a whole dynamic of its own, uh, let alone, the writer Scott Kahn being the 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 lead actor as well, so um, so it was quite the exercise for us uh, to to evolve and grow and get a lot more perspective on on how in house we normally are. Um, but it's yeah, I mean, it's uh, cobbling together this ensemble cast. Sam was uh, was really a treat. Um, it was done uh, under a lot of pressure. I think we had very little time, um, both uh, last minute prep as well as very few shoot days um but it was as with anything independent film it was truly a perfect storm it ended up being more of a comedy than we anticipated um i think just based upon the the dynamic of the characters um and it was really um serendipitous in that regard uh very enjoyable we're grateful to our partners at lionsgate um who really enjoy it and are putting a quite the theatrical commitment behind it, as well as our international partners at Universal, uh, with whom we did Ida Red um, a few years back. So it's uh, it, it was amazing. Uh, of course, that trademark Oklahoma summer uh, took some of us down here and there. Um, no matter how well hydrated or prepped you may be, uh, you're still going to get faint. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and that's part of the secret sauce, I think. Uh, um, bringing in these incredible actors, uh, both local uh, and remote um, and, you know, getting them all Oklahoma up. Uh, and it's, uh, and I think this, this kind of neo Western action comedy is it's on the one hand, such an homage to, to so many of our favorite films, but on the other hand, I think truly original uh, for all the reasons we mentioned and more. That, that was something that I hadn't originally planned to ask about, but I find that really interesting. John, can you talk a little bit about that collaboration, you know, having written uh, most of your films to this point, and then this being something you're directing a script by another person, how did you find that collaboration? Uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a learning experience uh, to, you know, uh, you know, I think writing something or, or, or directing something that somebody else wrote is one thing, but directing something that somebody else wrote, who's also the star of the movie is a whole other thing that, uh, you know, I think like out of a hundred rolls of dice that maybe happens once. Um, so it was a very unique experience in that regard. Um, and it, I learned a lot, you know, um, I learned a lot about working with, um, a writer, um, you know, and I, I, you know, in the event that I ever work with a writer who's also the lead actor again, I learned, a, you know, a lifetime worth of knowledge. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was the 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 thing that was most fruitful for me was just learning how to approach material with with zero personal connection, you know, and be completely objective to it. And uh, I will certainly take that with me moving forward. And can you talk a little bit more about this cast? I mean, I, I Frank Grillo is a big name. Captain America movies comes to mind. The Purge comes to mind. And he's been in several of your films to this point. But in this one, we got J.K. Simmon, J.K. Simmons, excuse me, which that's Academy Award winner uh, right there. It's like, that's got to be on another level. Can you talk a little bit about that, John? Uh, yeah, I mean, J.K. was a friend of Scott's. Um, and, you know, in one of our many, many, uh, uh, conversations between Jeremy and Scott and myself about casting and how, how this movie was going to actually, you know, come together financially. Uh, I believe Jeremy mentioned JK in one of his casting lists and Scott, you know, volunteered that he knew him and, and gave him a call. And uh, JK was gracious enough to, uh, to come down and give us his time. So um, yeah, he's a uh, heavyweight um, and a Titan on screen. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's a treat to to get to watch somebody like that work and be a part of it. Jeremy, I'm going to throw to you. Do you mind uh, talking just about bringing this cast together? And it's such a well-known cast. Uh, so I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, you know, it's 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 amazing. I mean, John and I, we're really in our own little world. We have no idea how we or our films are perceived. So to hear you say that is flattering, um, right? I mean, it's casting-wise. Uh, we're, we're always trying to, uh, to navigate, right? Um, 
actors who uh, we admire the most. Um, and you couple that with with the financial um, what impetus or uh, or incentives or requirements. Um, so um, with respect to Frank, who you mentioned, that was that was a, a Hollywood moment. You know, if ever there were one, right? It was um, Scott and I had gotten acquainted throughout this process, um, and uh, John and I, our last film, we had done Little Dixie with um, with Eric Dane. Um, so Scott and Eric go way back. So when I was going to have dinner with Scott one night here in Los Angeles, I said, "Oh, well, it would be fun to invite Eric because um, you know he and Scott go way back. Eric and I become buddies on Little Dixie." We're so proud of him with what he's doing on Euphoria on HBO. So, um, and then, uh, as is my way, right? I said, uh, you know what? Um, I love Frank Grillo and John. I've been working with him for years, so I'll invite Frank. Frank's always down for a good hang in Hollywood. So um, Frank knew uh, Eric because they have the same agent. Uh, did not know Scott. Uh, so it was uh, it was the four of us, you know, having dinner at this place, Craig's here in West Hollywood. And uh, long story short, it's already quite long, but maybe amusing. Uh, um, by the end of the dinner, Frank had basically cast himself <laughs> as Paulie Russo. Uh, and uh, and we said, all right, you know, we're going to do this thing in Oklahoma this summer, uh, what was then last summer. And uh, so that kind of took care of itself. John mentioned the uh, Scott connection with JK when he was on my casting list. Uh, Virginia Madsen, uh, Sideways is my favorite film. Um, so I've been looking for an opportunity to work with her, uh, as I have with Paul Giamatti and Thomas Hayden Church from Sideways. Um, Marianne Rendon, who plays Lola, uh, um, Mary Heron and I cast her in, uh, in a film called Charlie Says that's on Netflix. I was very impressed with her. Um, and so, um, circled back with her for this role, which was very difficult to cast. I think Lola has very specific sensibilities that she knocked right out of the park. Um, and then, of course, uh, George Carroll, uh, otherwise known as Slane, um, predated uh, my John Swab tenure. Uh, so Let Me Make You a Martyr, John's debut film they did together. And we've cast him quite a bit since, I think most notably in Ida Red, where he played Bodie Collier, um, opposite Josh Hartnett, Frank Rillo, William Forsythe, et cetera. So, um, yeah, so George came in, was actually uh, a replacement. Uh, we initially cast Michael Pitt, uh, for that role of Dom Lorenzo. There's a little uh, piece of trivia. Um, and uh, Michael, we had worked with on Run With The Hunted, John's in, in my first film together. Um, so for circumstances beyond our control, uh, we had to replace Michael. George Carroll came in at the 25th hour, uh, really uh, her in heroic fashion. Um, and then, of course, peppering the film with our, with our hardcore ensemble, including... Our beloved Billy Blair, uh, who's a Texas guy, actually, um, has been in almost every one of our films, uh, playing the, uh, the 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 low rent, uh, better call Saul esque defense lawyer Kenny Walsh, who's worthy of his own spinoff, and then our, our buddy, another Texan, uh, Dash Melrose, who's been with us on almost every film as well. Um, so just having a great time with it, um, you know, bringing in the heavy hitters and peppering in our our local Oklahoma and Texas ensemble folks who are our favorites. Thank you guys so much for coming on the show today. I can't wait to see One Day as a Lion in the theaters. And I tried to check out Little Dixie at the library and there are 58 holds ahead of me. So I, that's not a scientific poll or anything, but 58 holds ahead of me before I can get my hands on Little Dixie. So I think it's at least the people who oh, go to the Tulsa County library, library. are you going to? Uh, the Tulsa City <laughs> County Library, uh, uh, it, it's, it, you got fans, I gotta say. So well, I'm first and foremost, I'm floored that the library is such a prevalent means of, uh, of accessing a movie. Uh, and, then, and then that's awfully flattering. I mean, you know, people were so inclined they could, they could also rent it on any of the platforms or the DVDs available. But hey, much respect to the library and, uh, and as, as wonderfully antiquated as that whole system is. <laughs> hey, shout out to the Tulsa City County Library. I love it. Uh, but I, So congratulations on the film, guys. By the time this comes out, it'll be now playing in, in theaters and it'll be available on demand. So last question, and I just whoever wants to take this first, John, let's start with you. What's next? Are you going to ever take a break? Probably not. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, uh, we are in prep right now on a movie we're, we're going to shoot in June uh, called King Ivory, which is about the uh, fentanyl 
small epidemic. It's a true story uh, based in Oklahoma. Um, and uh, we're pretty excited about it. So, yeah, just to echo that sentiment. Um, we really pride ourselves on our uh, on our Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma law enforcement friends um, who afford us quite a bit of access and expertise. Um, and one day's line was no exception with um, our um, our buddy Sheriff Walton in, uh, in Rogers County uh, introduced me to Sheriff Turner up in Haskell County. Uh, and so you, you'll see the the Stigler County uh, jail or prison where we shot for one day's line. And the relevance to King Ivory, of course, is um, all the research we've done since with Sheriff Turner and, uh, and of course, Big Mac, you know, the state pan at McAllister, um, based upon the, uh, the, uh, the the fentanyl that's trafficked from the gangs in Big Mac, uh, as well as all the gang members that John's researched throughout Oklahoma. So it's, uh, it's very authentic and credible, and we're grateful to, uh, to the, all the aforementioned law enforcement, as well as the state film office. Um, so yeah, we'll be shooting that in June and July. That seems like an incredibly timely story, especially, you know, to be shot here in Oklahoma. So we're definitely going to watch that one with interest. Jeremy Rosen is the producer behind One Day as a Lion. John Swab directs the film. Guys, thank you so much for joining the show today. I appreciate you. Thank you. Such a pleasure, Sam. Thank you, guys. Wow, that was a great discussion. Probably one of my favorites from this show so far. But let's get right to my next interview. The Tonkawa Film Festival is taking place this weekend, April 14th and 15th in Tonkawa, Oklahoma. James Oxford is the festival's director. James, welcome to the show. It's good to have you. Thanks, sir. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's, it's been a while. I remember I, uh, I think I interviewed Brendan Gallagher last year, about a year ago. Yeah, because it would have been last year's festival. Yep, it was last year's. Yep. It was last year. So uh, I've been kind of involved with the Tonkawa Film Festival tangentially, kind of watching from afar. So it's been a while that I've been doing that, and it's nice to kind of bring it to fruition by having you on the show. So welcome. Uh, I do want to know, uh, you know, for those who don't know about the Tonkawa Film Festival, I just wanted to start off broad, kind of how would you describe it to someone who's never heard of it? So we are a short film festival um, located in a very small farm town in northern Oklahoma. Um, we we do not have a particular focus. We cover all genres. Um, we are international, so we have films from all, all over the world. Um, we show films that are 20 minutes or less. Um, and really what the festival is, is uh, we try to create a really unique experience for the filmmaker. It really is a filmmaker-focused uh, festival. So we do have a lot of kind of fun, cool, unique events that I think helps us stand out a little bit from the thousands of <laughs> film festivals that are out there for filmmakers to choose from. And what it, what it can people expect? I know you mentioned there's a lot of events throughout the weekend. What kind of events can people expect when they come? Right. So for so for the filmmakers, we, we definitely have a lot of private events. We have a welcome barbecue on Thursday night for them and the volunteers and some of the sponsors. Um, we also have a welcome uh, lunch for the, the filmmakers that's at TS Fork. It's kind of a farm to table uh, restaurant there in Tonkwa. Um, but on Saturday, that's where really the community gets to be involved outside of the actual screenings of the film. This is the other event. So we have a film festival themed parade. Um, we've had it since the very first year. It was a big part of what we decided from the very beginning to kind of help us stand out and make us unique. Um, so we have a, a parade through downtown. Um, we had $1,000 that actually donated this year from First National Bank of Oklahoma. So we're actually having costume contest and we're having movie themed car contest and floats and, and things like that. Um, all of our filmmakers will be in a horse-drawn wagon in the parade. So it's it's a very fun, small town um, experience. I think for the filmmakers that are coming from all over the country, we always have filmmakers from New York and L.A. and things come out. So it's really fun for them, but it's also a fun way for the community to kind of get to meet the filmmakers um, and just be a part of it. Yeah, I love that a, a film festival on this scale in, in Oklahoma, northern Oklahoma, is is, is really kind of unique, I think. So I just love that. And it really seems like it's something that, well, like you said, people travel all over to to kind of congregate there and, and share their love of, of film. And I just love that on the, you know, the film fan club. So I wanted to know how is the festival, this will be the fourth annual festival, fourth. right? Uh, how correct. has it uh, evolved over the years? I mean, I mean, it's, it's done, it's done very well. I've been very happy with how it's progressed. Um, we definitely, where we started and where we are, the 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 structure of it 
um, has has remained the same, but we've seen the sim missions um, definitely increase from year to year, um, which is a wonderful position to be in. It's also a difficult position to be in. Um, each year, the decisions that we have to make get more and more difficult. Um, so we've definitely noticed in the last couple of years, there's been lots of films that we just absolutely loved. We just can't fit into uh, the program. So lots of exciting things, a lot of great films, um, like I said, from across the country and from the around the world. I think the last two years is when we've started including international films. Um, this year, we've officially added a category for music videos. We've always had music videos as part of it, but it hasn't been an official category. So that's an official category this year, which is exciting. Um, and then, yeah, so we just see where we go from here. We think we're on the right track, so we're just going to stay on that path and, and just try to grow it as much as we can. I think you're definitely sounds like you're on the right track, adding international release or international features, uh, music videos, expanding categories. It sounds like it's just growing every uh, year. I wanted to know, you mentioned the submissions. I wanted to know, I'm sure quality obviously is a big uh, factor, but are there any other factors that you guys look at whenever you're, uh, you're considering submissions for the festival? We try to keep the submissions diverse. So one of the things we really look at is um, we, We'd love to have films in that we can tell that a very experienced filmmaker has made, and maybe this is their 10th short film or um, something that has maybe has some money behind it. But we also like to really look for those filmmakers who the production quality may not be really high, but there's some raw talent that's being displayed in that film. So we try to include those as well. And then, like I said, we definitely we have horror films and we have the dramas and the documentaries and things like that. Um, and we, we just want to mix it up as much as possible. One of the things that we do at the festival that I'm sure others do, but not all is we, all of our blocks are a mix of every genre. We don't have a horror block and a drama block um, because we find that sometimes audiences will be like, Oh, well, I'm a horror film. I'm fan. I'm going to go to the horror films and then they skip the rest. So we think it's kind of fun to say every block you come to, you're going to see, one or two of every single one of the types of, of films that we're going to show. So I think that um, creates a fun experience for the audience. Um, but other than that, yeah, we're just looking for unique voices. We love we love things that are dealing with the climate of, of the world, you know, the things that are going on in the world. We always get a lot of submissions about that. Um, it is one of those things where they say, uh, art imitates life, and that is 100% true. We notice that from year to year to year that the films we're getting are whatever's going on. You know, the first couple of years or especially the second, third year, it was a lot of pandemic films <laughs> about the pandemic experience. Now we're starting to see that change. We're starting to see a lot of films around immigration, the war in Ukraine, um, things like that. We're starting to see a lot of. So that it's interesting. It's 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 an interesting view into the world uh, through an artistic lens. So. We're excited I love that. About that. I, I mean, award season is is here, and and it's always nice. And then, like you're talking about, with what kind of films come through the festival every year, it's nice to see, or it's it's just interesting to see how art, like you said, imitates life, and how what we're talking about in the film community is representative of kind of what's going on larger in the world. Uh, jumping off of that a little bit, I, I wonder, you know, the official uh, list of selections for this year's festival is out. Is there anything right. you can kind of give our audience as far as a little tease, a little preview of what kind of films? They can expect uh this year um you know it's hard to say just because the films are we we definitely have a lot of the coasts <laughs> represented we have a lot of uh new york uh georgia florida films we have a lot of uh california oregon um are represented but one thing i will say that i've been really happy about especially this year is that the number of film submissions that we received from this area was significantly higher than we had seen in previous years. And so you're going to see a lot of Oklahoma films. You're going to see a lot of Texas films, Kansas films. So that's exciting um, because that's, you know, obviously we want that to be part of the mix. But, you know, in the early couple of years, we just weren't really getting a lot of of uh, submissions from those areas. And, and because I myself, though I'm from Tonkwa, I live in New York, a lot of my filmmaking friends are from the coasts. And so that's where we were getting a lot of submissions because that's where I was able to kind of get the word out the most. So I'm glad that the word is spreading 
everywhere. <laughs> and so um, so that will be something we'll, you'll see a lot of. And just kind of to my earlier point, you know, there are some definitely some documentaries and dramas um, dealing with uh, immigration and, and, and the issues that are going on around that. Um, we definitely have things around uh, the war in in Europe, um, and we had some of that represented last year as well. And it's so interesting to see that represented as a horror film or as an animation or things like that. So, um, so yeah, just just a lot of films uh, around those topics are very common, and then um, just a little bit of everything else, to be honest. What what I'm taking away from this interview, it, it, or what I'm really getting excited about about this year's festival, is is the diversity, like you're talking about behind the camera, people that you you said they're maybe not as experienced yet, but they have that raw talent, and also people who have been doing this for a while and they're getting a a shot to show their their talent finally, or it, people from the coasts, you know, like if you're living in Oklahoma, I don't really get an uh, an opportunity to see. I mean, I can see the big movies at an AMC theater, but I don't get a lot of time uh, to see those art house movies that you would that go through the festival circuit so it seems like talk and then also showcasing oklahoma talent as well you said that you're getting a lot more of that this year i'm just i'm really uh taken by the the diversity in all senses of the word uh for this year's festival that's what really seems like exciting to me uh is there anything else that you want to say that because again we're based here in tulsa oklahoma mm -hmm. uh tonkawa is in northern oklahoma the central part of northern oklahoma is there anything else you'd like to say about the festival maybe one last pitch to kind of make our viewers want to to make that drive out to tonkawa well, I, I will say that we definitely condense it. So if you're making the trip, it's it's we'll, we'll make your time worth it. So our first screenings take place on Friday evening. Um, we 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 uh, keep them in the evenings. Um, so we do three blocks on Friday evening. We do three blocks on Saturday evening with that big film festival uh, parade in between the two. Um, we have the Tonkwa Hotel. Um, and casino in here, which is a great place to visit. So, you know, people that are are making that trip, um, there's a lot to do. It, it, it may be surprising to come to a small town like Dongwa, but you come to the town, enjoy some screenings, enjoy the festival or the, the hotel and the casino, come back for some more screenings, a really great award ceremony where uh, we give away actual uh, physical trophies. Um, we give away a cash prize to the best of the fest um and so yeah i think it's it's a fun experience i think it's definitely worth the trip james oxford is the festival director for the tonkawa film festival april 14th and 15th 2023 james thank you so much for joining me today thank you sir i appreciate it and of course i'll put a link in the description of this video and in the show notes of the podcast version if you want to get tickets to the tonkawa film festival i'll also put a link to tulsa's circle cinema in case you want to see one day as a lion there i would highly recommend it and of course that's where you'll also find links for my social media sites i'm on twitter and instagram at samuel d carico i'm on facebook and tiktok at the film fan club but i really recommend that you subscribe to the film fan club here on youtube in two weeks we're going to be coming back with another episode about all things star wars star wars celebration and of course season three of the mandalorian that's in two weeks i'll see you then guys thanks